So, hi. Um, I do computer stuff and in security. Um, I, as I was going through the slides, and, and I never do the same presentation twice, I was going through the slides earlier and I was like, oh, I don't have like a, a good intro slide because this is Canada and I know like three people in Canada. Uh, and apparently there are, you know, there are more than three here. So <laughs> if you don't know me, I, I deal with security. So again, I was trying to rummage through some pictures that uh, from my Facebook feed and uh, try to figure out what, how to present myself. Uh, I have met the most interesting person in the world. Um, so I had to take a, take a picture with him. Um, I have a very interesting take on balance between having fun and uh, doing things right. Uh, so I try to, to stay healthy so I can drink and eat anything that I want. Um, I deal with security on different levels, not just computer. And part of that led me to teach a red team class in Colombia where uh, I admit to have teaching schoolgirls how to pick locks, which in turn they have taught the police that were securing us how to pick uh, handcuffs, which was really fun. Um, and not saying that I got kicked out of bars, because I did. Um, I think there are, there are a few countries that I'm not supposed to get back to. Uh, so again, leading an interesting life in security, as I'm sure you all are. Um, Life of a red teamer, I guess. So what's a red team? Who, who here did a red team, ran a red team? Oh, good, good, good. All right. Yesterday was, was full of red teaming, by the way. Uh, if, you, if you watched the talks yesterday, a lot of them had uh, really core elements of red teaming, which, which made me really, really happy. So first thing, just to, for the rest of you guys who didn't get their hands up or were too shy, which you can't be because you're red teamers. Uh, a red team, first and foremost, is not a glorified a penetration test. Okay, anything that says penetration test, throw that out of the uh, throw that out of the table. That's not a red team. Uh, a red team, by definition, is an attack or a simulation or an event that includes at least two of the three main elements for for a threat: electronic, physical, and social. If it doesn't include at least two, it's not a red team. And it better include all three to simulate what a real attack looks like because attackers are not limited by scope. They're not limited by your idea of, well, sure, let's test our security. So, you know, there are some URLs and IP addresses, go at it, okay? They don't work like that. <laughs> they look at you as a target, they figure out what's most important, and they go for it. And they don't care if it's out of scope. They define the scope. A red team is pretty much like getting into a fight. You can have a great plan before you start, and then you get punched in the face, and then all your plans go to shit, and now you have to deal with getting punched in the face. So a red team is kind of like being able to go into a fight knowing that you're not going to get killed at the end. Okay, so that's kind of the analogy that I usually portray to my clients. Uh, you'll have a chance to fight Mike Tyson without getting your ear bitten off. Why run a red team? Uh, I'll start with, with the, uh, why you shouldn't run a red team. Well, first of all, it's not compliance. Right? Compliance has nothing to do with security. It's a great thing to get budget for to do security things, but a red team is not going to get you compliant. So that's, that's out of the way. And another reason why not to to run a red team, or why it's better than a pen test, is because you're not dealing with hackers. Wow, I know. Um, most of the times when you're doing a pen test, the result shows you what it's like to deal with a pen tester. Okay, it's not what it's like to deal with an actual attacker. Uh, hence, a red team is the way to try to test uh, how how you fare up against an, an actual adversary. Uh, so to put things in perspective, you start off with a vulnerability scan, okay? Turn on the volume, you get to a pen test that includes a little more elements that is a little more aggressive and interactive and you actually get to exploit things. And then you really turn on the volume to, you know, to 11 and you get to a red team, which is a full adversarial simulation. You're dealing with a no-scope adversary 
you don't know exactly when it's going to happen. I mean, you, we usually, as red teamers, get a, a, a window of opportunity in which we can operate. I'm not going to tell you when. It could be at night, it could be in the morning, it could be the last day of that 30-day 30, 30 window. It could be the first one. You're, you don't know. That's the trick. So again, compliance doesn't matter here. Um, a red team can get you compliant if you do the right things. Okay? Usually a derivative of a red team is going to be, oh, <laughs> I guess we fixed all of that. Now we're compliant. <laughs> That's awesome. But we're also secure. Um, and, and the key to thinking of a, of a red team is really to think outside of IT. So yes, there is security outside of IT. Again, shocking. <laughs> but once you realize that, and you realize that you're working with organizations, with businesses that don't give a shit about IT, they give a shit about how to make money, it's a whole different, oh, thank you. Now the presentation is going to get much better. <laughs> Does someone have an opener? I'm sure someone has. Bottle opener? I'm not, I'm not talking until I get the... <laughs> Or I can crack it open on that laptop. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much. Ah. You want one? All right, take the other one. <laughs> you see, that's why you should stand up when someone asks you if you have an opener. Thank you. Mm. So, ah, this is good. Thank you. So, a red team is a wonderful thing, right? How do you actually get a team <laughs> to run the red team? Uh, which is kind of interesting because, again, you're not looking for your typical pen testers slash hackers. You're looking for something a little different. Uh, so we'll go back to the basics. We go back to electronic, physical, social. Right? We, we, we said that the red team includes a combination of all three, hopefully. So let's look for skill sets that correspond to those different elements and build a team where the overall components of that team can cover those different elements. And they better operate like a team and know each other and train together to actually uh, simulate a, an adversary. So it's, it comes down to a very simple Excel file, right? That's how you build a red team. <laughs> uh, you just need to find the right people that have the right skill sets. So Bob may be you know, excellent at lock picking and CCTV cameras and, and jumping over fences and stuff like that. Um, but he's not really great at social. On the other hand, Joe is an awesome social engineer. Right? He can create spear phishing emails that everyone clicks, like 99% success. He can talk to people over the phone and convince them to do shit that they didn't even think was possible. Uh, he can stand in front of them and chat with them or take them out to a bar and you know, get them to, 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 a, to a situation where he can take a picture of their badge or, or clone it or just convince them to let him back into the company. Uh, and Jenny is the uber hacker, but she's, you know, she's kind of not that great on, on, on the physical stuff. But you take all three and you build a team where everyone knows their, their strengths and weaknesses and know how to complement each other, you get a red team. Again, and, and you look for the different skill sets based on your particular situations. A lot of times, a red team is going to be electronic heavy or social heavy okay, or physical heavy. And you'll need to adjust those, uh, those skill sets based on what you're, what you're dealing with. The next step is going back to the, to the books to understand, all right, so now I have a team. How do I actually execute? Well, again, it's simple. First of all, understand how a business works. It has nothing to do with IT. It has nothing to do with software vulnerabilities. Right? Understand how a business works. More particular, how the business you're attacking works. Build a threat model. Understand how to threat model the different aspects of that business. Right? What's exposed? What's not? What? What actually matters? If I, you know, if I root the server, what am I gonna get? The idea is not about rooting a particular server or or breaching a perimeter. It's understanding what do I get when I do that. So if there's no point of rooting a server. Don't do it, all right? If the ac actual critical assets lie somewhere else, focus on getting to those assets. So again, build a threat model around the business, around the assets, understand how the business works, and after you get that, you can actually kind of layer on 
your ideas of, uh, and this is kind of what we're, we're dealing with, with most of us on, on pen testing, we're, we're dealing with vulnerabilities, right? We're looking for software vulnerabilities and hardware and so on and so forth. Uh, and once you add up all those elements of threat modeling and how the business works, you get to the magic word risk. Uh, it's magic because it pays way more. Don't tell anyone why I told you that. Um, so you get to risk, which is composed of a, all those different things that actually look at how much money we're going to lose if this happens. If some vulnerability actually gets exploited by a threat actor that had access and caused them damage, bam, that's my risk. If the risk can't be quantified in monetary terms, it's usually not a real risk. And the business doesn't care about it. Right? Again, if you can't explain why this is important for the business, in terms that the business understands, they're not going to pay for it. They're not going to protect it. If you can, show them. Show them that you know, if I take this rack, right, this server, and pull it out of the rack, you're out of business, right? and I have a picture of me right, in a pickup truck with a server in the back going like, and they go like, that's a risk. Okay? If they go like, oh, yeah, we got hundreds of these. They're all redundant. What did you just do? <laughs> and you just go like, mm. but I have root on that server. It doesn't matter. Again, understand the context. It may be the crown jewels. It may be nothing. Like, yeah, right off $1,000, I get another server. I don't care. It's a hiccup in my system. So first rule of red teaming. As I said, go for the juggler, right? You don't start a fight, and, and excuse me for, you know, for, for the fighting analogies, especially when I'm wearing this. You don't start a fight by kind of you know, finding out what's going on. You start a fight trying to finish it as quickly as possible. That's at least what I learned you know, in my days and what, what I still practice in Krav Maga. And you start a fight, or you don't start a fight <laughs> to begin with. But if you get into a fight, you try to finish it as quickly as possible which means go for the kill shot, all right? There's no, you know, there's no messing around, there's no sparring or anything like that. Bam. Find out what's most critical and go straight for that. Plan correctly and just go for it. Um, and this is, you know, this is, again, my fighting analogy. My, my Krav Maga instructor uh, has a cool saying that says, uh, oh, you, you learned karate. Awesome. What other dance classes did you go to? Again, it's not about form, it's about effectiveness. It's a red team. Again, we're not here to make IT happy or audit happy. We're here to test if the business can withstand an actual attack. Case closed. Second rule, again, you're going for the juggler. You're not, you know, you're not training. You're here to get to the kill shot. And again, I'm, I'm going to immerse you with some Israeli culture. <laughs> Because that, that's where I grew up and, uh, and trained. Um, there's a, there's a, and again, this is like a way off in, in the cultural spectrum of things. Uh, there's, a, there's an Israeli movie about uh, um, this, this uh, high-ranking officer in the army that's, that's talking to someone else. And, uh, and they're talking about how do you, uh, how do you swim a 100-meter sprint? And it just goes. You start as fast as you can. And then slowly go faster. You just give everything you have. It makes much more sense in Hebrew. Here's the Hebrew quote, if you, if you really insist on it. Oh, this is gonna hurt. <coughs> Sorry. So now that we kind of understand what, what a red teaming is, again, not pen testing. This is the real deal. Let's try to paint a company red and blue. Uh, because I've talked, I've talked, I spent 20 minutes talking about red teaming. Uh, but I didn't really any talk about the blue teaming side. And you can get all sorts of red teaming information. And, and again, yesterday's talks were awesome. Uh, they gave out a lot of information about you know, the different aspects that go beyond pen testing. But what about the blue team? What, you know, how do they make sense out of a red team engagement in a way that actually matters and changes the organization's security posture? So let's paint you know, some... I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through some scenarios that, that I've personally went through, uh, red teaming, and not just focus on, hey, look at me, how cool is this, you know, I won. But really look at, okay, so we did this, we succeeded, 
And then we had to work with the blue team to make sure that they, they're implementing the takeaways from this engagement. So I'm going to put red and blue side by side and see how that works. So first, first one. This is an interesting story. Um, red team was, was kind of limited because we were on a strict time frame and we couldn't get to the location, uh, so we couldn't do physical at all. So we only had social and electronic, which kind of sucked, but then I was like, you know what, I, when I usually teach red teaming, I have a saying that says, during your intel gathering phase and intel analysis phase, you should, your result should indicate the end result for the entire red team. So if you do your intel correctly, you want the red team. That's it. Everything relies on the intel that you, you gather initially and, and analyzed. Uh, so we're looking at this company and started, started gathering information, and more and more and more information. Um, and at some point, we, we reached a, a level of understanding that led us to really understand what I call the social fabric of, of how the company works. Um, a good example is understanding the, the salary discrepancies for, for the same job title. And look at a, com at a company that's, that's hiring really fast, a lot of junior, like college graduates, and at the same time still holds on to, to a lot of, you know, old people like me uh, that, are, that have 10, 15 years of experience in the same job title, same job bracket. Uh, they're obviously paying to com completely different brackets of salary to the same job description. Socially, you're going to be sitting, you know, I'm trying to find someone really young. Oh, there, this guy. He's going to be sitting next to me, all right, and he's going to go, but we're doing the same job. And I'm probably doing it better. I mean, he's probably doing it better because he's young, he's, you know, enthusiastic, he's, everything is fresh. He knows his shit way better than I do, all right, because he just learned it. He probably works long about longer hours, and we're doing the same thing, and he's more productive, and I'm getting paid more. So... The social element here is, is really strong. Based on that information, uh, we launched a, a social engineering attack online. Again, we couldn't do it uh, um, physically, so we did it online and over the phone uh, and used that element of, of, again, of that social fabric, that really disturbing element uh, to coerce people to click on links and then get into the network. So from, from, a, from a red team perspective, Again, we're, we're actually we're simulating actual intelligence gathering. This is the level of intel gathering that an adversary would go through. It's really understanding, you know, how much people make, where do they live, uh, do they have families, do they have kids, where did they go out. Again, really understanding how everything works in the company and, and everything uh, um, works in, with the people relating to the company. Uh, create key personnel profiles, including executive profiles, all right? Where's the CEO going? Where is he traveling? It's fairly easy. Again, social, so, social media gives you a lot of information. Everyone loves to check in on Facebook and Twitter and, and, uh, and Swarm and Foursquare and whatever it is. Um, so it's really easy to understand where people are going. Start to build a pattern around that and, and produce a hijacking profile. CEO freaks out when they see that. It's like, what? That, that's my kid here. All right, that's my wife. That's when she picks up my kid from school. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and she checks in there every day and then goes to the Starbucks and they're buying something and, you know, just saying would be a nice opportunity to give you a call from that Starbucks and say, hey, you listen to that? That's your kid. Yeah. How about them, uh, them stocks now? What, what are you guys planning on in terms of M&As? Bam. All right? That's called leverage. <clears throat> so identifying social weak points. Right? Again, back to how the organization works, what matters, what can hurt the organization, or how can I as an adversary take advantage of that. From a blue team perspective, the key was really identifying and understanding what information is public. All right? What is it out there right now? What am I leaking from an information perspective, from an intelligence perspective, that I need to know about? All right, without understanding what I have out there, I can't even start to, to control it. I can't to the, talk to the CEO all right, and, and, and run him through some, some educational process of 
stop checking in on Foursquare every time you go to see, you know, the company that you're trying to, to acquire. Okay, tell your wife and kids that yes, everyone's on Facebook, blah, 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 but their daddy is a big, you know, Fortune 500 CEO, so they can't do this shit all the time. Give them alternatives. Okay, again, it's really understanding what kind of exposure they're, they're facing right now in order to, for them to properly train their people to avoid that or at least to control that. And again, work with HR on social issues. Remember that, that salary gap? How to deal with that now? You have a problem. And, and you're, you know, as a red teamer, your, your job is to stand with the mirror and say, this is how you look like. And this is the effect of that gap. So now, it's not an IT issue. It's not a legal issue. It's an HR issue. How do you deal with that? Maybe you promote some of those, you know, the, the elderly guys. Maybe you, you, you build a promotion path for the young ones. You give them some, some horizon in the company that says, you know, you're going to get there. You're going to be the slacker who sits there all day. <laughs> all right? Yeah, it gets, gets paid a lot. I don't know. Figure it out. But again, it's, it's an HR process. Deal with it. And that, that again, that, that was great working with the different departments in the organization, not just IT, because we're solving a very holistic problem. There, I've said it. I'm going to drink, yes. Next example. Um, this example goes a, a little more into the physical realm. Uh, so we, we had a financial client, <coughs> lots of branches uh, nationally in, in the U.S., and, uh, and they had a really strict process. I mean, these guys were locked down tight. Every, every new location, you know, they have a tight setup. Uh, everything's configured at HQ. It's shipped over there. All they need to do is just bolt it into the, the, the ceilings and whatever it is. The, the access points, VPN, everything is airtight. Access point configuration is awesome. Latest technology, everything is encrypted, fully authenticated. And we were like, fuck, you know, or we're, we're, we ain't going to get nowhere. Just hammering on those, those, uh, the, the perimeters and, and trying to get into those branches. And then I was like, okay, so you said you're shipping those access points, right? To the remote location. And they're bolting them to the ceilings. So we had two opportunities here. One is shipping, okay, where we target the, the supply chain. Once everything's configured, what if I get my hands on the device, all right? What, what information can I get from it? Two, what's the physical security in your branches? This is a financial institution. People come and go, all right? They don't need authorization. What if one of those access points is in a public area or a semi-public area where I can kind of, you know, this is a downtime, no one's here. Just plug it out and run away or put it in my, in my uh, magic and a, a backpack. So we looked at the physical part, managed to get a couple of access points from those two different elements, one from, from a physical location and one when we actually intercepted a shipment in, in HQ. It didn't even get to the FedEx guys. We managed to, to get in the back of the loading docks and, you know, and just pick up one of those packages that we've identified this is going, you know, to, to some remote location. Got our hands on an access point and uh, basically pried the firmware off of it because now I have physical access. I can just you know open the device, find a JTAG, or or find find a way to extract the firmware, extract it, and now analyze it. At that point, um, we got to this little thing. I can't say shit. It's uh, we managed to get the file system uh, off of off of that firmware. And that included some uh, debug folders that contained, and I don't know if you can see, the uh, IKE, PSK, uh, and the passwords and the users that had the VPN information for that access point to VPN back to HQ. Awesome, right? So we take these, run an a open VPN on, on a Linux machine, pop them in, bam, we're in. Game over. We're in, like, because <laughs> this is a branch. It needs to go back to HQ and do all the transaction processing and talk to the mainframes and, and all that fun stuff. So from a renting perspective, again, we went for the things that, the, that IT 
weren't prepared for. Again, IT was solid. I mean, I love those guys. I worked with them for, for years. And every year we have, a, you know, the challenge becomes more difficult because this was, that was the first year that they were like, okay, let's red team. I think, you know, their, their CISO was like, I think we're at that point where we can go and expand. And I was like, I was waiting for that. <laughs> <coughs> Sorry. So we went for supply chain, right? So this is a little outside of the realm of IT. And we pierced their perimeter paradigm because they were like, all right, we are airtight, right? There's no way anyone gets in. This is solid. And they really relied heavily on that notion of perimeter, and at, which, at, at which point I'm like, oh, well, see that, you know, VPN coming in? That's not one of your branches, right? This is me in my little Linux box, and I'm inside. And there's no segmentation. There's no separation of duties. I'm just in. Um, and I can access whatever I want. You have no access controls, role-based access controls once you're in the network. Again, from a blue team perspective, it was a phenomenal opportunity to, for the CISO to take a bigger role in executive management and go like, all right, we need, you know, we're, we're really focused on security, but we're not doing it across the board. So it was his opportunity or her opportunity, whatever it is, not going to expose anyone here, to really go beyond just IT. So they went to supply chain, they went to, uh, to other, to like applic applicative elements inside the organization. Look at monitoring, all right? What's an unknown? How do you monitor an unknown event? Again, that VPN connection should have triggered a lot of red lights because it's not coming from a known entity, okay? It's the wrong IP address, it's the wrong geo, Ad, uh, geo IP address, it's not, it, it doesn't make sense. Why isn't this alerting anyone on anything? Uh, and really look at role-based uh, authentication and, uh, and access controls instead of just, you know, I have a perimeter, yes. <coughs> Supply chain, uh, it involved process, so changing the process or, or straight, uh, tightening up the process, especially when you talk about sensitive information or equipment that needs to go in and out. Uh, so better tracking of where the actual physical devices are. It's really easy to have uh, uh, just a GPS tracker. Um, and again, we're not talking about hundreds of shipments that go out every day. Right? You can invest in a little GPS tracker to make sure that this very highly sensitive package actually gets to where it needs to get. Um, they did work with, with Aruba later on to, to fix that vulnerability in, in, the, uh, in the access point. Uh, but again, it's mostly process on the supply chain and making sure that the minute the package leaves IT, you can account for it. So think chain of custody, same goes for that, that sensitive equipment. Later on, it expanded to other elements that we're, we didn't even test because they took that example and the CISO was like, oh, we have other stuff all right, that gets moved from one place to another. It could be inter-office, it could be in the same city between offices, it could be across the country. I don't know where it is, all right? Once it leaves my desk, I have, it's like it goes into a black hole and pops up in the other location. I don't know if anyone tampered with it. So we're looking, they were looking at tamper, tamper proofing specific uh, packages with sensitive information and they're looking at better tracking. So at any, any given point, you can know exactly where it is, where, where's the package, who's got it, how do I contact them? And if anything suspicious comes up, who do I call? All right, so that, that went to the supply chain. Again, it's not rocket science. It's not, it's not a big deal and you have suppliers, you, you can do it internally, you can do it externally, outsource it, whatever it is, there's solutions for everything. So it's not, you know, we didn't have to come up with some, you know, drones for, <laughs> for shipping those packages point to point or something like that. We're good? All right, next example. This is, this is pretty cool. Uh, anyone recognize this panel? Mm. All right. So this is a, um, this is a studio panel from a, from a TV production. Yeah, pretty cool. This uh, is a DNF. Um, I think this one is, yeah, Flex Control Network. This basically controls little robots. Um, if you don't know, most studios these days 
especially in TV production, don't have people behind the cameras. They're all robotic. Okay, so all the big fancy cameras, they're just, you know, there's just a little robot that moves around, pans, whatever it is, and everything is programmed automatically. Per show, they know exactly where a camera placement is. They go switch, switch, switch. They don't need clumsy people to step over cables and kind of go like this. It's not necessary. It saves a lot of space. It saves a lot of money. Uh, so this is, this is the, um, the web interface for, for one of those. Uh, this is a mixing panel, I think. Yeah, this is the um, device configuration for a barracks. Uh, it's kind of a mixer for voice over IP and PA systems and all kinds of nifty stuff that happens in, in a studio. I've learned so much new technology that I was not exposed to before this. Uh, super cool. Again, the, 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 one of the big advantages of a, of a red teamer, when you go like, oh shit, what is this? <laughs> and you Google it and there's like zero results because it's, you know, there's this one company that manufactures this for these two studios and that's it. Uh, so there's, you know, there's no docu documentation. You just start fl fiddling with it. Um, this is a, an audio studio for a radio, uh, and this is the back end of that audio studio for the radio, uh, where you can control everything that happens, everything that gets mixed in, the music, the cues, the advertisements. I can shut down the, um, the DJ's mic so there's no voice, uh, all, all sorts of, of cool stuff. Um, in this gig, we were tasked with red teaming a, a big media organization as you can understand. And, and my guys at the end of the, the engagement were like, and I actually included that quote in the report, were like, shit, we can have our own reality show. Because we ended up with control over cameras, lighting, script, okay, teleprompters. So you can actually play puppet master, all right, <laughs> and put shit on a teleprompter, and, and these guys will just read anything that runs there. I mean, they have no prep. They, they read the news. They have no idea what they're talking about because they're like, hey, announcer, you look good. Sit here and start talking. And they're like, okay, and they, they just read, all right? It's not like they spend the whole day actually researching and coming up with the stories. They're just a pretty face. Um, so it was kind of cool to, to show these guys, you know, what we can do. Uh, and that made it to the report. I insisted on, on being a little, uh, a little obnoxious and, and, yeah, we can have our own reality show to just put whatever we want, including media that, that you know, here's a clip from, you know, uh, the, the, the traffic in New York. Oh, shit, what is this? <laughs> Goatsy. No. Um, that did not make it to the report. Um, so from, from a blue team, red team perspective, again, what did we do here? Uh, from a written perspective, we ran into all sorts of undocumented, unknown stuff that was on the network. That barracks thing, we had, we spent two days trying to figure out who the hell knows what this is and how it's being used in the studio. No one knew. They had to find this guy that installed it. It wasn't even IT. It was some old uh, audio technician that, and, you know, everyone is using it. They just know, don't know that they are. Um, I was like, who's barracks? What's barracks? I'm like, no, no, it's not a who, it's a what. It's a <laughs> where is it? That's the cool thing. It's, it's a lot of times you run into things on the you know, cyber side of things, and, and you ask people, so where, where is that barracks installed? I mean, how does it look like? Is it like a 4U you know, rack, or is it like a little Raspberry Pi-sized device? And people are like... I don't know. <laughs> you go to the studio and there's like shit sprawled around everywhere. <laughs> Try to find, you know, a little sticker that says barracks. No. Um, so the red team exercise was really, you know, about learning how stuff works. And we had zero information. I mean, we didn't go to production school or, or you know, any, any kind of media uh, production education to understand how things work. We had to pick it up from scratch because that's what we were simulating. A random adversary that was going after to, to shut down the network or to, to affect uh, the, the production. Um, we, as, as part of, of controlling the lights, for example, we showed how we can change the environmental elements and merge them in with social. Okay, so if, when one of my guys was at the front door dressed as a technician, um, we were playing with the lights. 
And that's a big thing in, in, in studios. I mean, you can, you can fry people off with those lights if they go up too high. And if it, they don't match, you know, I mean, you can really screw up a TV production if your lights are wrong. As we're playing with the lights, the technician comes in and is like, hey, I'm the, the, the lights technician. I understand you have a problem with the lights. And everyone's freaking out in the studio because they can't control the lights. Right? It gives you a really big advantage when you need to, to get physical access again. And really combine all of those elements together to, to come up with, with a, a valid attack. From the blue team perspective, uh, again, it was their opportunity to go beyond IT. That barracks, that, uh, you know, we, we got to, to an area of production that they didn't even think uh, they were supposed to control. I mean, through that network, we got to the, to the radio studio. And they were like, no one's managing the radio studio. I'm like, oh, well, I do now. Uh, better think about how to control that because that's, again, that's sensitive information there. Uh, huge opportunity to, to recruit stakeholders. Uh, media traditionally is not really big on security. Uh, that was their opportunity to really go to the right stakeholders across the organization and get their support when they come up with a report that shows we played with the lights, we, we had access to cameras, scripts, all right, uh, the media that goes on uh, in, in the mixing studio, and guess what, teleprompters. For some reason, teleprompters are huge. It's like they don't trust their, the, the, the news anchors to actually say, I probably shouldn't say fucking shit on TV. <laughs> well, my prompter is just full of it. It's <laughs> uh, so yeah, it, it was a, a great way to, to recruit those and really educate people on the entire business process. So breaking them out of that IT, IT, IT thing. And, and again, the IT got really no recognition in, our, in that organization. Now they took a, a much more prominent leadership position. I'm going to skip through this. And next one, and run off to, to here. So, ooh, sorry. Um, again, another, another example where uh, out of the box thinking, and I had, you know, telling you to think outside the box is really inside the box. It's like everyone is doing that. So, um, just a little a different way of looking at security. Uh, we managed to get to, uh, and I think this is the one. Yes. This is awesome. One engagement where we're inside the network and we're starting to look around. And I'm not going to elaborate on you know, how we got to the really cool stuff because this is one element that, that struck my interest. And I find this sonic wall firewall access point you know, all in one thingy. And I'm like, awesome. We managed to, to get in. We get in, we have full control. Uh, and we can change configuration and add a VPN, add an SSID so I can connect from outside, you know, with my password and, uh, and trunk between the two. So, I mean, this full control. Um, I was like, oh, this is awesome. You know, I can get in from the outside. I can get in physically. Great. And uh, the trick was when I go back and present the report, people are like, yeah, um, we're not using Sonic Fall firewalls in production. And I was like, uh, yes, you do. I mean, I, I rooted this firewall and I, I have, act, I mean, let me show you. <laughs> and I VPN in and I get to the production network. And they're like, well, that's, oh, that's, yeah, they're, okay. So it wasn't in production yet. Okay. This particular device and many others like it in many organizations go through some staging environment or staging process where they test and make sure that everything is okay, but it was on the network in a highly accessible location from the network to get access to other element, other areas of the network. They had no idea it was in there. When you talk to the techs, it's like, yeah, of course, we're, you know, we're, we moved it from initial testing, we ran some testing, make sure everything's okay, and then we moved it over there to see how it works with the actual network. So, you know, we, when we get the, the thumbs up, we flip the switch and everything works with that same password that was used in testing, which was the default one <laughs> that this Sonic Wolf firewall comes with. I mean, this is not magic. I mean, I'm not, I'm not some uber password cracking guru. I just really know how to Google. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
I'm not, I'm, it's like one of my best friends and I are not supposed to be in the same room together Googling for more than 20 minutes. If that happens, shit starts to break. Seriously, there's a rule. So in, in that particular uh, engagement, again, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to focus on what we actually did there and, you know, all the bizwang, woo, uh, because this was really interesting, again, from, from a process perspective. Non-production equipment is almost as, if not more important, than what you have in production. Because if I can affect that and backdoor it, I can guarantee it's going to get to production. So production might be uh, more difficult for me to attack directly, but if I can find a way in your process where there's a vulnerability in that process and, and affect that equipment there, think about NSA routing uh, Huawei equipment, for example. Okay? So finding another way that's easier to, to access for that equipment to reach production. And again, just put a backdoor in there because that configuration is going to stay. They're not going to wipe the device and say, all right, we know that this configuration worked. Let's start from scratch and actually do it because it doesn't make sense. From a blue team perspective, again, understanding that security is not about prote protecting your production. It's about having a, as wide scope as possible. You need to be involved in early design stages, in early, early, early uh, during the thought process when you purchase things. All right, when you put out an RFP to, to look for equipment, security should start there from the requirements phase throughout testing. Again, testing is not about, look at the cool gizmo I have, let's play with it and see what it can do. No, it's here for a purpose, all right? Security has something to do with it because it, it, this thing will have some role in the process of making money in this business. How do we protect it? Uh, so testing should take that into account and also implement uh, uh, security elements all the way through staging and production. Again, thinking about the process, not about the end result. Um, uh, and really test to production uh, uh, processes of now you have a stable version, how do you bless it and make it now production? What's your process? How do you protect from it? Last example. Um, Going back to Intel gathering and, and kind of what I do now in, in, uh, in Zero Fox, which is uh, really red teaming on social networks. Uh, we looked at another company, uh, fairly limited engagement because it was just Intel gathering. Intel gathering and analysis, and they're like, do phase one and then we'll do the rest. So it was kind of the, the, the red team was kind of broken down to phases. Let's look at phase one. Phase one, I try to. to Censor this, I hope nothing uh, uh, substantial comes up. So phase one, uh, we managed to find and create impersonating profiles for the brand that we were going after. Because that brand, specific one, did not have an official presence on social media. Guess what happens when a major brand suddenly have presence on social media? you automatically engage with everyone associated with that brand. Employees, customers, marketing. We started getting you know, connections to this profile. And this is early phases of the profile. Uh, we started getting connections from resellers. They're like, hey, let's do cross promotions and blah, blah, blah. It's like, awesome. I am now this business. I c and, and you can gather shit tons of intelligence by going on social media and engaging and interacting with people. Um, another element, uh, one of the key individuals in, in, that, uh, in that company did have social, social presence online. Um, and we did manage to, to track down a couple of networks and, and create, imperson again, impersonators there to see what kind of uh, effect we can, uh, we can create. And on one of those social networks, uh, we managed to fill in enough information to hijack or, or, you know, because that profile was not really well maintained. You could see it's not, uh, didn't have a lot of connections. Uh, so we impersonated that person. Again, brand was one. Now I'm a person. They do have other social media profiles out there, not on this particular network, 
that profile was not really uh, up to speed. We created another one. We start engaging. Again, this one, we have 40 followers. And guess what? About 30 of them are other executives in the brand, in the company that we're, we're engaging with. So again, we started by mimicking the behavior on other social networks in terms of the tone and the content that that, that person was talking about. And then once we got that, that initial trust, it's like, oh yeah, it's the same thing. They're finally on Twitter, okay? We can inject our content. And again, affect other people, lead off to social engineering. Oh, here's a link, bam, I'm in. All right, I'm in that circle of trust. They're clicking on my links and I can track it because I, I'm posting those links and they're all like shortened versions so I can actually track performance and see exactly where they're coming from. Once I get to that level of trust where I see that my mimicking posts are being followed and clicked on, bam, I'm in. Again, from a red team perspective, what we did there is, and, and, and it's funny because we were tasked only to do intel gathering and analysis. For me, this is intel gathering and analysis. But it got to a point where we got clicks on links that I'm posting to water hauling sites that you know, had the proof of concept, I just didn't armorize it, so I didn't to totally exploit it, your, your executives. Um, but I'm really, you know, in, in a very limited scope, I managed to impersonate the brand and the, the executives, control the discussion around, whoop, sorry, around the brand, uh, um, and really reach out to customers, partners, and employees. Uh, and the social engineering part from the, 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 the person impersonation, bam, just let us right in. Second phase is basically done. I don't need, I mean, I just need to put in the right payload on, on, the, on the server that's serving the links and it's game over. It's like, what, what do you know, what do you want now? I'm in, I have, you know, I have one of a, a board, board members PC. What do they have access to? <laughs> From a blue team perspective, uh, again, social media monitoring. How do you actually approach social media from, from your company perspective? How do you control, do you have an official uh, social media entity representing the brand? How are you tracking your people? How are you protecting your executives from people impersonating them? Owning the discussion instead of following it. Again, it's the, the, there's a big buzz about, you know, What's going to happen? I mean, Target was, was breached. Everyone's talking about it. And Target goes like, we'll be back in 10 days while we figure out our shit. All right? Home Depot is breached. Took them a week and a half to start talking to people. They're losing the opportunity to own the discussion. Instead of just going out and saying, yes, we've been breached. We have a problem. We're looking into it. This is what we're doing. Without going into, you know, <laughs> we called Mandiant, and now they're sitting here, the three guys, one name's Matt, one name's Rob, and it's like, yeah, okay. <laughs> we're dealing with it. We'll get some more information in a day. Come back after a day. We got some more information. We're looking into this, this, and that. No, 10 days of radio silence, everyone's, I mean, the brand is, is losing control. Own the brand, own the discussion, and identify the threats before they materialize. Again, if, a, if they were able, A, I gotta, you see I'm Canadian now. <laughs> I gotta get out of here. Um, <laughs> if they were able to identify that rogue impersonating account that started getting traction on Twitter and started getting followers and, it, and looks, you know, uses the same picture from other accounts because that's public, right? They're using the same content because that's public but it's not really tied to that person. It's an impersonating account. If they were able to identify that earlier on into the game, they would be able to stop, you know, and push me back to phase one where I don't have already clicks on my server wanting to get the malware. <laughs> and I'm just like, no, 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 not yet. Make sense? Cool. So how do you actually blue teams work. Well, this is, this is old school blue teams. Um, <laughs> back in the days, that's, that's you know, or, or first time customers, that's, that's usually the reaction that you get. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> this is not supposed to happen. Um, 
good examples lead on to, to different, different cases. This is an example of a, a spear phishing campaign where we actually used a legitimate uh, survey monkey, I think they're called. Yeah, survey monkey, and you know, we followed on current events in the company, and the, the fish was just mm, perfect. And I was like, we're going to get in. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, we get a call. Like, we shut it down. They managed to identify that because they trained their people so well. And, they're, and, and out of the six people we sent this to, uh, one opened it like for real, and three alerted security and actually sent them a notice saying, this doesn't look right. Could it be something you know, suspicious? Which is awesome. Within 10 minutes, we get a call. We're like, yeah, we got the malware. We're analyzing it now. I'm like, fuck. <laughs> This is awesome. <laughs> We're going to have to work harder. Um, so again, this is an example of a blue team that worked correctly. Identify things. Don't panic. All right? Control the situation. And escalate and, and do the research. Uh, quick response. Assess. Involve. Minimize damage. Again, they immediately just segmented off those, those pieces. They identified exactly who we sent the fish to. Segmented them off. All right, didn't, didn't cut connectivity. Again, this is, this is the worst thing that you can do. It's just like, oh, shut down the PC, reformat it. It's like, no. <laughs> keep them active, but, but keep them segregated so you can control, control them, control the environment, and apply the learning process to go on and on and on. Given this was not a first time you know, red team for these guys, but again, that's how you can see that red teaming actually pays off. And I was like, you know what? I'm happy. I'm happy. This is fine. I'm going to screw with you later, but you know, you got this one. All right. We got to the, to the nasty part. And I'm going to speak business now. So hmm. get ready. ROI. <clears throat> Red teaming makes sense. All right. And if you do it correctly with a proper focus on blue teaming, it actually pays off. So yes, you have to invest initially in your red team. And you have to invest it over time. But as you go along, you will see the ROI climb on in the sense of what do I get from my blue team, All right? And if the blue team, if, if your security posture just focuses on IT, you're doing it wrong. Go back to square one, screw red team, All right? Go back to understanding where your gaps are, okay? Get the buy-in from the right people in the organization that are outside of technology, all right? Remember that matrix slide? There's security outside of IT. Deal with it. Find the processes, understand what processes, uh, what people you need to protect, and then what technology is there to protect from or around, and then reapply it to the organization. Once you get there, you will see that blue, the blue side coming up in, in the sense of things that they actually stopped. Okay? And you will see the return on that investment in, in red teaming or whatever exercise you're doing to improve your security. Tricky part in red teaming is retest. All right? When you do a pen test, um, you find a vulnerability, you exploit it, bam. All right? And then they call you back after a week or two or a month, and they're like, we fixed it. Can you retest? And you're sure. Bloop. Run again. It worked. It didn't work. You have a binary result. Work didn't work. It doesn't work like that on a red team. Why? Because we're not talking about a vulnerability, a technical vulnerability. We're talking about a process. So when we do retesting, we look at the gap. We go back to the threat model, identify in that threat model, all right, what broke, what processes broke, which people did we affect, what technology was involved, and try to recreate another attack vector that uses the same elements, but is not the same. Because if we do the same thing, well, first of all, you can't do the same thing, by definition. All right, when we did that attack, it was NCAA, like, draft time, and everyone was, and my fish was NCAA, hey, look at that. Now, we're, you know, a month or two months later, there's no basketball going on. I mean, this is football season, whatever it is. I can't use the same fish I used before. I need to find another path. Uh, so again, it's not about, you know, click, Click enter again to, uh, to go. It's about retesting the gaps in the threat model where, where things broke in the threat model. Recall? Again, this is not pen testing. 
deliver. At the end of the day, you're delivering success. All right? It's not about you know, a, a report that this, that's this big or that big. It's about a report that makes a change. All right? Don't try to sell. If you try to sell, you're not going to get anywhere. All right? Don't try to say, again, and, and, and it's really tempting to go, I rooted all your environment, blah, 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 blah. I'm, you know, I walk out with the server. No, that's not the point. The point is to talk business. And yes, you will have to understand how to talk business because that's what's going to pay your next engagement. And if you don't sell, you'll sell more. How's that for Zen? That's all I have for you now. Beer? Yes. There's different roles in the team? Damn it, I knew this would come. <laughs> um, I usually run the red teams. And uh, I mean, I've, I've been doing this for over 15 years now. Um, I can tell you where I started. I started as a Linux geek. Uh, I moved on to networking. Uh, I got into physical uh, a little later. And I'm a lock picker, as, as you can see by the Colombian schoolgirls. Um, and later on, I picked up uh, more social engineering. So I can't say I'm an expert in, in something particular. I mean, I can still, I'm a VP now, all right? I don't need this shit. <laughs> but yesterday, I was hacking Python because uh, it was like, we need to get this somewhere. And there we go. And then you just hand it off. So I can still dabble with all different elements. Um, so I'm, again, I'm, I'm mostly kind of the, the coordinator get this shit done, you go over there, all right, this is how we're going to plan things out. Um, and where needed, or where I find it entertaining, <laughs> I'm like, okay, move, move, move. <laughs> Let me show you how it's done. Um, so if there's an interesting physical part of it, I'll, I'll pop in. If there's a, you know, so some cool social engineering, uh, I'll pop in. Uh, but I'm mostly just moving parts along. Any more questions? I, that was brave. Asking a question before beer, I was like, I, I'd be like, I'm out of here. Shut up. <laughs> no? All right. Awesome. Thanks for having me.